Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another weekly recap of our chronological reading from Genesis to Revelation following the chronological presentation of the Reese Chronological Bible. We finished up number 19, week number 19 today, and we're at the 14th day of May, 2022. This week's reading covered a little less than 20 years. The dates that we find in the margins in Reese's Bible is beginning around 961 BC and ending up today around 945 BC. It's after the time of David, he has passed, Solomon is the king, and in the last couple of weeks we've read about Solomon becoming king and finishing the temple and we began to wonder about some of the things that we read about him and his life and his marrying a lot of different women and having numerous concubines and amassing large amounts of horses and chariots and uh, large amounts of gold and silver, things that Moses instructed the nation of Israel and the kings of Israel not to do. And uh, we find that seemingly most all of the kings that we'll read about, whether it's northern Israel or southern Judah, will seemingly go against and not observe those instructions that Moses gave. And it will end up in heartache for them and problems for the country. And that's where we see Solomon headed. And we ended last week beginning into the book of Proverbs, which was written by Solomon. Remember that Solomon asked for wisdom when the Lord appeared to him at the beginning of his becoming the king and asked what he would desire. And Solomon gave a good answer at that time, a, a wise answer. He asked for wisdom to be able to lead the people. And God granted him that. And he also gave him riches and honor. Well, this week, as we began our reading, we began in the seventh chapter of Proverbs. And if you have our reading material, you may recall seeing that I made a comment in one of the margins that normally, if I would underline things as we read through or make comments or notes about them, that I didn't do that so much in the book of Proverbs or in the book of Ecclesiastes either, because what might seem to stand out to me might not stand out to you or seem as important or get uh, your attention like it does mine and vice versa. And so I encouraged you to underline and make notes to yourself as you read through the book of Proverbs. And a good portion of this week was in the book of Proverbs. And then we found ourselves getting into the book of Ecclesiastes, also written by Solomon. And uh, Proverbs chapter 8, we read on the first day of this week. And that's one of my favorite chapters in the book of Proverbs. It speaks about wisdom and the fact that wisdom dwelt with God even before the foundation of the earth and the world. And the book of Proverbs refers to wisdom in a female gender as a lovely and precious woman it, that is to be desired to have wisdom. And we also see that he spoke about understanding. And one of the Proverbs, he said, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get ris wisdom and with all you're getting, get understanding. We also read uh, chapter nine, which is another great chapter of uh, referring to, to wisdom. And then in that first day, we uh, made it all the way to Proverbs chapter 12. And Proverbs 12, 26 said, the righteous should choose his friends carefully for the way of the wicked leads them astray. And we could certainly make application of that in our lives even today, can't we? And those are the kind of things that we would try to encourage our children about, making wise friends or choosing your friends wisely. Well, I've probably commented before, but I try to always read through the book of Proverbs once every month. And if you read one chapter in Proverbs every day, then 
you just about read through the book of Proverbs every month without having to read extra because there's 31 chapters in Proverbs. And this is one of the few books that Reese takes us through just about from beginning to end once he starts it. He does uh, interject a lot of things in other areas of the Bible that he presents to us in his chronological fashion. But in the book of Job that we had in the first week of our reading, and here this week in the book of Proverbs, also when we get to Ecclesiastes, <clears throat> it's almost all the way through each of those books without interruption or interjection of something else. But you may recall that we read chapter 31 of Proverbs back at the beginning of Solomon's reign as a king. That speaks about the virtuous woman. And so then we're reading through uh, Proverbs 2 or Proverbs 1 through uh, 30 uh, last week and this week. Well, as we moved on through the book of Proverbs, we came to Proverbs 21. And I like those first two verses of Proverbs 21. I have them underlined in my Bible. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. And then verse two says, every way of man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. We moved on in the next day uh, down into the uh, Proverbs 25, verse two. I always think of the late Dr. Chuck Missler because I heard him quote this verse many times in his Bible teaching. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. And then in uh, chapter 27 of Proverbs, a very familiar verse to many of you, I'm sure, uh, a portion of that verse says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. And then as we approach the end of the book of Proverbs, one that I have underlined, I have quite a few things underlined in Proverbs in my own Bible and in the chronological presentation, but I chose not to speak about all of those things. As I said, I think it would be good for you to pick and choose the Proverbs uh, that are the most meaningful to you to underline or to spend special time with. But in Proverbs 28, verse 9, it says, one who turns away his ear from hearing the law, or we might say the word of God, even his prayer is an abomination. And I certainly wouldn't want my prayers to become an abomination to God. <clears throat> I seem to live and depend upon my prayer time with the Lord, asking him for grace and strength for each day and certainly forgiveness of sin and his mercy and his blessings. <clears throat> well, we then got past the book of Proverbs and we went back into the book of 1 Kings and in chapter 11 of 1 Kings, we read about what was uh, given a subheading of Solomon's backsliding. It's kind of a, uh, a question in my mind and maybe in yours and other people's too. Here's the wisest man who had ever lived up to this point in time, maybe forever. And yet he went through a period of time that he got away from God and it was referred to as his time of backsliding. And uh, we find that in 1 Kings chapter number 11. I won't bother to read, especially verses 1 through 13. I won't read the first portion of it, but I want to begin reading in verse 9. So the Lord became angry with Solomon because of his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. The first time was when he asked Solomon what he would desire and ask of God when he first became king. The second time God appeared to him was at the dedication of the temple when he prayed to God and prayed for the people there and uh, where we came across that famous verse of 2 Chronicles 7, 14. As I went back and listened to that particular uh, video, I erroneously referred to it in the video as first Corinthians or second Corinthians 7:14, but it was second Chronicles 7:14. 14. 
if my people who are called by my name shall turn from their evil ways and humble themselves. And you know how that verse goes. That was the second time. So the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. Remember the multiple wives and concubines that he had that were not Israelite women, uh, worshiped other pagan gods and turned his heart away from God <clears throat> and commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord God commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this and have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father, David. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant, David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Jerusalem was in the area of the inheritance or the allotment for the tribe of Judah. The other tribe that would remain with the tribe of Judah in the southern kingdom, which would be recognized as the southern kingdom of Judah, would be Benjamin. And the other 10 tribes would separate from them and be under the leader of a man named Jeroboam that we'll read about. And those 10 tribes will be referred to as the northern kingdom of Israel. So because of Solomon's backsliding and not keeping his heart true and tender to God, God is going to bring about chastisement and judgment. What we will read about later in the Old Testament as we move beyond these times of the kings and we get into the times of exile and especially in the book of Ezekiel and Jeremiah, we'll discover that God promises and prophesies that one day out into the future, he will bring all of the descendants of the tribes of Israel back together into one nation, no longer to be divided again. And I believe that we have seen that happen and continue to see it happen in our lifetime since the nation of Israel was again recognized as an independent and autonomous nation beginning in May 14th of 1948. But we'll get to more of that as we go on through our reading. But he says, nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father, David. God remembers his covenants and remember the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant are unconditional covenants. So the stage was then set for this civil war, so to speak, or the division between northern Israel and southern Judah. And it will take place during the lifetime of Solomon's son. And we'll discover who that will be in our next week's reading. His name will be Rehoboam. So God will always remember his covenant with Abraham and his covenant with David. And the descendants of David will always have someone sit on the throne. It will culminate when the Lord Jesus returns as the Messiah and the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and set up an earthly literal kingdom ruling from the throne of David in Jerusalem. When um, the uh, when David died and when Solomon became king and then later on we'll read when they go into captivity to Babylon, southern Judah does, there is then no throne of David when they come back from captivity. The Gentile nations are then the ruling powers of the world that we'll read about when we get to the book of Daniel and see about Daniel's prophecy of 70 weeks of years. But we then came to uh, the beginning of the book of Ecclesiastes and read through the 12 chapters of Ecclesiastes this week and ended up with the last of the chapter 13 or uh, the last of chapter 12 today. And Ecclesiastes is another book that Solomon wrote and the subheading talked about uh, the uh, 
book written by an unhappy condition of a black of a backslider, I think was the subheading that Reese put in his Reese Chronological Bible. But there's a few famous phrases or words that we read from the book of Ecclesiastes that you may have noticed. Uh, Nothing new under the sun. All is vanity, said the preacher. And the preacher uh, refers to Solomon who wrote the book as himself being the preacher. There's nothing new under the sun. All is vanity. Then uh, when we got into chapter three of Ecclesiastes, you may have recognized that chapter that spoke about a time for this and a time for that, I think was probably the inspiration for uh, one of the uh, rock bands in the 60s writing a song called Turn, Turn, Turn. I think the, the band was called The Birds. And there's a lot of songs that you may think about as you read through the book of Ecclesiastes that uh, it is not one of my favorite books to read through, uh, kind of like uh, the book of the Song of Solomon I don't feel comfortable with and also um, the book of Job and Ecclesiastes kind of falls into that group. But there's a lot of gems in the book of Ecclesiastes that we find. And uh, one of the statements that we find in there is that the race is not always to the swift. I can remember having a boss uh, that worked as the manager of the meatpacking plant that I worked at for 18 years after I got out of college, used to make that statement in our staff meetings quite often, the race is not always to the swift. And we find that here. And then as we came to uh, the eighth chapter of Ecclesiastes, verse number 11 says, because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. And that always makes me think of our country when I read that verse and passages like that. When there is a swift execution of judgment upon disobedience or things that deserve some type of judgment, it serves as a deterrent to further wrongdoings. I lived in a time when I went to grade school and junior high and high school when it was still an approved thing to give swats or uh, licks with a paddle to kids that had done wrong. And of course, 99.9% of the time it was boys. (laughs) But in the grade schools in those years, they had these long halls and tile floors. And if a student was taken out into the hall and given swats, you could hear that ring and echo up and down the halls of the school and it would be a reminder to the kids that heard that and a deterrent to keep someone maybe to make them think twice before they did something that would deserve that type of corporal punishment. Well, we have laws that are based off of the Bible in our country. And one of them, according to scripture, is uh, corporal punishment and uh the death penalty. The death penalty, capital punishment, was ordained by God in the Bible for certain crimes and certain things that people did wrong. And we instituted that in our country. But we haven't followed through on that very well. And even that has turned into a loss of a deterrent for bad criminals and people not to do evil things. But I think of that when I read this verse, because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men are fully set in them to do evil. And then at the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, some the last verses, verses 13 and 14 of chapter 12, give a great summation of what we might think that would come from one of the wisest men that ever lived. Those verses say, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, whether good or evil. Tremendous words in those two verses. That would be good for us to live by, wouldn't it? Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God 
and keep his commandments, or this is man's all, or what is required of man by God. Well, next week we'll get into life beyond King Solomon, and we'll read about the division in the nation of Israel that will result in northern Israel and southern Judah, and the heartache that comes along with all of those things. There are consequences for sin in every generation and in every nation of people. And it concerns me then when we make application of those principles to our own country in the day in which you and I live. So I would encourage you to keep up with your reading. We finished week number uh, 19. We'll be in week number 20 starting tomorrow. Remember that if we stay up on pace, uh, we'll finish our journey uh, through the entire Bible by the 16th of November. So we're working our way day by day closer and closer. So I hope you're enjoying the reading and uh, we'll look forward to seeing what we have to recap this time next week. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the principles that you give us to live by in your word. Thank you for the truth of your word when truth seems to be a moving target in our day and time. Thank you that we can always go back to the principles of your word and know and believe and have confidence in them being absolute truth. Thank you for those who join us online. I pray for your continued blessings upon them and their families and homes. Help us, Father, as we read through your word together this year that we will see opportunities to make application of the scriptural principles in our lives each day. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hope you have a great weekend and a great Lord's Day tomorrow. Enjoy visiting and fellowshipping with other believers, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Lord bless you.